big thank you to H Mexico for inviting me. It is a huge honor for me to be here. I knew that when I grew up someday, I wanted to be an artist. And then I remember it vividly, drawing all the time. And then uh, I'm 11 years old, and I go to the movies, and I see a movie that changes my life. I see the movie E.T. Has anyone seen that movie? Yeah? So I'm watching E.T. in the theater. I'm 11 years old in New York, and I remember at the end of the movie, I tap my mom, and I say, Mom, that is what I want to do someday. She's like, what, you want to leave planet Earth in a spaceship, <laughs> you know? And I said, no, Mom, I want to make movies. Look, guys, I grew up in New York. I didn't know any directors. I didn't know any filmmakers. All I knew was one thing. When I looked up at that screen, it was something that I wanted to do. I just had one huge problem. I had no idea how to do it. So I went to the library. I got books on cameras, lenses, storyboarding. I found out the director of E.T. is a Jewish guy named Steven Spielberg. I thought, oh, if he could do it, he's Jewish, I could do it. I found out that every weekend Spielberg would get a video camera, kids in the neighborhood, and he would make little movies. So I went out and bought a camera. I got my sister, of course, and my older brother, friends in the neighborhood. And every weekend we'd make movies, murder movies, monster movies, kidnap movies. One movie, I got to tie my sister up to a tree extra tight. Afterwards, we went into the house to watch the movie. I remember my mom saying, I like the movie, but where's your sister? I said, she's still tied to the tree, what's wrong? <laughs> but I was gonna be a director. And then I get to high school. I'm in high school, sophomore year. Someone comes up to me and says, well, what are you gonna do when you get out of high school? I says, well, I'm gonna be a director. They say, no, you don't wanna do that. I said, no, I really do wanna do that. They said, no, you don't, because if you want to be a director, you're going to have to move out to Hollywood. And Hollywood is filled with weirdos. You don't want to be a weirdo, do you? And I looked at this person and I said, I don't want to be a weirdo. And right then and there, I was so impressionable, I gave up on my dream of wanting to be a director because one person told me I would end up a weirdo. Of course, today, I do live in Hollywood, and my four kids would tell you Daddy is a weirdo, so, so much for that. But at that point, I gave up on my dream. I said, okay, instead of being a director, I'll go back to being an artist. My parents hired an art teacher to come to our home once a week. She would teach me drawing from life. She would say, drawing is about seeing. She'd set up a bowl of fruit, pastel, watercolor, charcoal. She had me work in all different mediums. She had me draw my hand from a different position every day. She said to me, you're struggling with drawing hands. If you draw a hand from a different position every single day, you know what'll happen in six months? You'll get really good at drawing hands. And I did. I got my portfolio together. I love being an artist. Then I went to the movies and I saw another movie that changed my life. I saw the movie, The Little Mermaid. Anyone seen that movie? Yeah? So I see The Little Mermaid and I'm like, Mom, that's what I wanted to do. She's like, what, you, you want to fall in love with a fish? <laughs> I said, no, Mom, I want to work in animation. It clicked for me. You know, it's amazing how many people have seen that movie over the years. Millions of people have seen that movie, but when I saw it, I looked at it and I said, that is what I want to do because it combines my passion my love of drawing, my love of filmmaking, put them together, animation. And plus, I found out that Disney has a studio in Orlando, Florida. Ah, I don't have to go out to Hollywood to become a weirdo. So there I am in high school, a junior in high school, and I know exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. Saul's dream is to become a Disney animator. I just had one huge problem. I had no idea how to do it. You know what I do have? The most supportive mom in history. She takes me on a trip from New York to Disney World. She's walking me around Disney World all day, embarrassing me, going over to everybody, saying, my son wants to be a Disney animator. Can you help him? My son wants to, I'm like, mom, please. <laughs> We're getting on the, it's a small world, right, boat ride? I remember the lady's like, how many in your party? We're like two. We're stepping on the boat. My mom says, excuse me, before we get on the boat, my son wants to be a Disney animator. I'm like, mom. The lady's like, man, on or off the boat? This is a ride, it's not an animation studio. Finally, at the end of that day, walking around, we're exhausted. See, today, you wanna to figure out how to get into Disney? You go to Google and you type in, how do you become a Disney animator? And you'll have about 850 answers. Maybe 50 of which are true. 
But back then, my mom, to take me from New York to Disney World, just to be able to get a little bit more clarity of what her son needed, that was awesome. Finally, one person said to my mom, if your son wants to work at Disney, he's got to be part of the Disney cast. See, everyone at Disney are called cast members. If he wants to work at Disney, he has to be a cast member. So you're going to have to go to the Disney casting building. So we drive four minutes away, we get to a building. Can you imagine what a Disney office building looks like? It's beautiful. It's amazing. And uh, this is actually a photo I took a couple years back of it. That's the building. It's the Disney casting building. I walk up to that building. The doorknobs look like the ones from Alice in Wonderland, the ones that speak, you remember? There's the doorknobs. Bam. I remember walking in, and there's this huge ramp that goes right in front of me. After this gold statuettes of Mickey, Donald, Pluto, Goofy, I'm like, wow, even the air in here just smells like Disney air, you know? Like pixie dust in the air, you know? I remember walking up that ramp, wow. On the ceiling is painted Peter Pan and Wendy. I'm like, wow, this is a Disney building. There's a painting of Walt Disney on the side right next to me. I'm thinking to myself, how will I get here? How will I ever work here? Finally, the lady calls me for my interview. I'm sitting there. I'm a high school kid. She says, what are you doing here? I said, well, I want to be a Disney animator. She says, well, we don't hire animators here. I said, well, who do you hire? She says, we hire people that work in the parks, you know, that work the rides. I said, well, that's really not what I want to do. She can tell I'm discouraged. She walks out of the room and comes back and hands me a piece of paper. That piece of paper she handed me was the most important piece of paper I ever held in my hands, other than my wedding ketubah, my wedding contract, and my wife, of course. You see, that piece of paper was a recipe for achieving what I wanted. It was a list of eight schools, eight art schools that Disney recruits from. She says, if you want to be a Disney animator, you have to go to one of these schools. See, in my head, it was an equation. Salt plus go to one of these schools will equal dream of becoming a Disney animator. All of a sudden, the impossible became possible. Do you know how many times I meet with students and I ask them, what is it that you want to do with your lives? Most of them don't have the clarity to know, but the ones that do know, I'll ask them another question. How are you going to achieve that? They say, well, I don't know. And guess what? If you don't know how to accomplish what you want, you're probably not going to accomplish it. You go to a great restaurant. You taste an unbelievable dessert. You want to make it at home? Well, you can do it if you have the recipe. Then it's possible. That piece of paper became the recipe. So my mom took me on to a tour of all of these different art schools to see which would be a school that her son should go to, which would be a good fit. As I'm walking through the walls, through the halls of different art schools, I'm thinking one thing. Who am I going to be friends with? Who am I going to hang out with? Do you have any idea how strange students are in art school? <laughs> Pick the weirdest person you've ever met and fill an entire school with them. I'm talking strange. I get to one school in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. The guy's touring me around the school and showing me all the most incredible artwork on the walls, and I'm blown away by it. It's awesome. I said to this guy, your seniors are so talented. He said, Saul, every piece of artwork you're seeing is done by our first year students. None of it is our seniors. They're a year older than me, and they're a hundred times better than me. Do you know how I felt? I was intimidated. Why would I want to go to an art school where I would be the worst one at the school? Why would you want to step on a basketball court and play basketball if you know you are the worst player? But you see, I have a theory. I don't care if you're two years old. I don't care if you're 120 years old. Every single person in the entire world wants the exact same thing you do. Everybody wants greatness. Nobody wakes up and says, you know what I want to be? I want to be average. I want to be mediocre. We all want greatness. If any of you are business owners, if I asked you, what kind of business do you want to run? Do you want to run an average one? Of course not. You want to have a business so successful it makes Steve Jobs look like he knew nothing about business. Are you married? Did, are, you, are you single? If you're a single person, I said to you, you know what? I have an average person for you. Do you want their number? Could you give their number to my friend? I'm kind of looking for someone great. We all want greatness. So how do you get it? Michael Jordan, my hero growing up. Michael Jordan, arguably the greatest basketball player who ever lived. Michael Jordan is in the NBA, the National Basketball Association. The first year, after one game, he was already known as Air Jordan. He had sneakers made from him. He was making a gajillion dollars a game. 
How's she gonna translate kajillion? I'm kind of curious. <laughs> People had the Michael Jordan posters up all over the rooms. He was Michael Jordan, and in his first year, he steps off the court during one game, and a critic, a sports writer, comes up to him and says, Michael, you're a scoring machine, but you know what? Your defense is a little slow. Do you know what Michael could have said to the guy? I'm gonna listen to you. Do you know how much money I just made <laughs> in the last 45 minutes? You're probably wearing my Air Jordan sneakers. Your kid probably has my posters on his wall. I'm gonna listen to you. But in Michael's head, he said in an interview years later, there's one thing he thought. When this one person told me I don't have a defensive game that's strong, I guess I better work harder on defense. And he did. And next year in the NBA, one player is named the Defensive Player of the Year. And of thousands and thousands of players, one man is called out, Michael Jordan. Because we want greatness, here's how you get it. We need to know what we do well. That's easy, we all know that. You know what else we need to know? What we don't do well. You know what, that's easy also. We all know where we don't do well. Now comes the hard part. In the place that we don't do well, that's where we need to invest ourselves. That's where we need to work on ourselves the most. If you could walk by Steve Jobs years and years ago while he was in his garage making the first Apple computer, and if he walked you over and said, come here, I want to show you what I'm working on. You got to see this. It's awesome. Oh, you walked in, you looked, there's that wood board with the first Apple computer. If you looked at it and said to Steve, Steve, good job. That's it. You know what he would have told you to do? Thank you. Could you leave now? But if you said to Steve Jobs, good job, but did you ever think about connecting this one like this? He would have hugged you. I guarantee when Steve Jobs finished making the very first iPhone, it was a bittersweet moment for him. Why was it sweet? Think about the years and years of technology and hard work and endless nights that his employees worked on to create that very first iPhone. And when he was finished, it, it had to ship to stores because they were orders. I guarantee it was a bittersweet moment. Sweet, because he did it. He accomplished something, but bitter, because he had to stop. And I guarantee when he shipped that first iPhone away, he went right back to work, took all his people around him and said, you like the iPhone? You feel good about it? Good. Now how can we make it better? We all want greatness. The secret is figuring out the equation of what I need to work on to become great. Many people are good at a lot of things, but how many are great? So when I looked in the artwork in this school, and I knew that they were 100 times better than me, I thought one thing, this is the school for me. Because they're much better than me than any other school that I had seen. And if I go to a school like this, I'll have to get better. And I chose the school, and thank God they chose me. First day I get to school, I remember I'm about to walk into my dorm room, and uh, my roommate is in there, you know, he already settled his stuff in. And before I walked in, I'm thinking one thing, just be normal, please. Like, who am I going to be stuck with in this cave for the next semester? I have no idea. And when I opened the door, my roommate actually wasn't in there. He'd already settled all his things in. So I walk into the room, and I'm looking at his stuff, you know? And over his bed is a life-size sculpture of Jesus on the cross. I'm like, you have to be kidding me. This isn't like a little picture, a little picture. This is a life-size human male nailed to a cross. This was his high school art project. He had created out of paper mache. I was the only Jew in my school. My roommate had a shaved head, a big blonde mop of hair that went over one eye. I absolutely never saw that eye. Totally hid. He was like, what, like the Phantom of the Opera, you know, with the eye? The guy had these red leather boots that went up to his knees. Up to his knees, and there were 50 holes for the laces, but he wouldn't put laces in his boots. I said, Joe, how come you're not putting laces in your boots? He said, because saw laces means conformity. And I'm an artist. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> I remember walking down the dorm rooms. I looked into another guy's room. And I see this guy has Mickey Mouse slippers. And I'm thinking, what kind of a guy wears Mickey Mouse slippers? No offense if any of the men in the room own Mickey Mouse slippers. I'm not judging. Maybe I am a little. So I see this guy has Mickey Mouse slippers. Over his slippers, there's a Mickey Mouse bedspread. There's a Mickey Mouse telephone. There's a Mickey Mouse clock. A Mickey Mouse you know, lunchbox. It was every Disney movie poster on the wall. It was Disney World in a room. Do you know how I felt? I was intimidated. I didn't have any Disney stuff. All I had was a Michael Jordan poster over my bed and one Disney book. 
and I see in the corner the guy's got sketchbooks. I'm thinking, let's see how good he is as an artist. He's not here. I pick up a sketchbook. I'm going through it, and I'm looking at his drawings, and there's like a hundred drawings of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Mickey Mouse playing baseball, basketball, scared Mickey, sad Mickey. I never drew Mickey before in my life. Then I see another sketchbook. It says hands and feet. I'm thinking, oh, that's one of the things my art teacher used to have me draw when I was in high school. Let's see how good he is in hands. I pick up the sketchbook, I'm thumbing through it, and there's hundreds of hands. Four finger white gloves. That's right, the Mickey Mouse hand from all different positions. I turn to leave the guy's room and I bump into the guy whose room it is. Uh-oh, I'm busted. I look at him, I go, hey man, I I'm, I'm sorry. I just He looks at me and he says, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm good, what, what's your name? He says, my name's Jason, but people call me Mickey Mouse Jason. I'm like, they call you what? He goes, Mickey, I'm like, I heard you. you. You have a Disney nickname? He's like, what, you don't? I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't. I go back to my room, I get on the phone with my mom, and I say, Mom, if I'm gonna fit in an art school, you gotta send me Mickey Mouse slippers. <laughs> I'm not making this up, this is true, because everyone around me were like Disney people. I, I, just, I didn't have it. A week later, a representative from the Walt Disney Studios comes to our school. He stands on a stage in this giant auditorium, 350 people are there. Every freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. The guy from Disney looks out to us and he says, out of the 350 of you, how many of you want to work at Disney someday? Every hand went up. He said, out of the 350 of you, maybe four of you will ever work there. That's how competitive it is. And as soon as he said that, you know what I thought? I wonder who the other three are gonna be. You see, in life, you either believe in yourself or you don't believe in yourself. It's like a light switch. The light is either up or it's down. You could take that light switch and put it in the middle. You could put it anywhere you want. It's either gonna be on or it's gonna be off. We either believe in ourselves or we don't. And at that point in my life, I believed in myself. My parents gave me that confidence in myself. I was excited because I had clarity of what I was working towards. Then he said, if you want to work at Disney, here's what you need. You have to get the internship. If you don't get the internship, no Disney. And if you want the internship, here's what you need. A portfolio, 25 pages of figure drawing and anatomy all drawings of people done from life. He says, we don't want to see any drawings of Mickey Mouse. I was like, oh yeah, Mickey Mouse, Jason. That's right, sit down. You can see him like slouch in his chair, you know? Oh boy, you know? <laughs> but to me, the equation was building. You see, first the equation was salt plus, go to one of these schools, check, I got that. Salt plus, now I know I need a portfolio, 25 pages of figure drawing, and I'll get my dream. Now I know what I have to do. I go to figure drawing class the next day. I'm sitting there, 50 students in a circle. I got my sketchbook the first day, sharpened the pencils. I had my Run DMC old school hip hop that got me in the zone. We're all sitting there, ready to go. The model walks in, <clears throat> she gets into a pose. We're about to draw. Before we draw, the professor says, before you draw, I want you to look at the model. So we're looking at the model. She's not moving, it's getting a little awkward. How long can you stare at someone not moving? Well, two minutes went by. Three, four, five minutes went by. Finally, five minutes, he says, okay, get ready to draw. We're about to draw. He says, hold on, before you draw, model, I want you to leave. She's like, uh, sir, I'm supposed to be paid for a four hour session. He's like, yeah, we'll pay for the whole thing, but we don't need you anymore today. Take your stuff and go. She gets up and walks out. I'm sitting there, all my friends. The professor looks at us, he says, okay, now draw. I said, sir. He says, is there a problem? I said, yeah, the model's gone. How am I supposed to draw? He says, well, what did you do? I gave you five whole minutes. Did you look? Did you really look? Did you walk around the model and see what it looks like from all different positions? He says, you have to develop your eye where you look at the pose that a model's in, the gesture, the angles, and you see that gesture for a second, you don't even need the model anymore because you've seen it. He said, drawing is about seeing. Reminded me of what my high school art teacher used to tell me. I love this professor. First week in school, everyone's going out, partying, drinking, having fun. I go to a party. I'm at this one party and I see everyone drinking and there's one guy in the corner, this is the same story, this guy in the corner is doing drawings of people drinking beer. 
I said to him, what class is this for? He said, it's not for a class. I said, so why are you drawing? He says, because I want to get better. He became my best friend. His name was Andy. And Andy was by far the greatest artist in the school. And you know what really made him great? Is the guy never stopped drawing. And I can tell you, just being friends with a guy like this made me a better artist. Gave me discipline. Gave me a better work ethic. Because who we choose to be friends with in our lives actually affects who we become. Who we choose to be friends with, we're actually choosing what kind of person do I want to be. I can tell you, I remember the students walking down, the, you know, the art students, like lazy, smoking, blowing off their homework, and then there's Andy, nonstop working. One project would take a student an hour, Andy would put 14 hours in it, and I started changing my work ethic, and I was becoming a better artist, a better person. It was awesome. Sophomore year, I'm about to send my portfolio to Disney, now, I didn't really expect to get in, but I thought, you know, I'll go through the process. I take the portfolio and I send it to Disney and I wait. A month goes by. I get an envelope one day on Walt Disney Studios stationery. The little gold leaf Mickey imprinted. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. I open up the envelope. I remember I call my mom. She's like, open it already. I'm like, okay, my mom. And it says, Saul Blinkhoff, thanks for sending your artwork, but unfortunately, you didn't make it. Look, I wasn't discouraged. I was a sophomore. I didn't really expect to get in. I thought, you know what? I'm so happy that the Walt Disney Company knows that I am alive. <laughs> I took that letter. I put it up over my desk. I'm like, wow. My friends are coming. Wow, Disney knows you're alive. That's awesome. <laughs> Another whole year goes by. Me and Andy are drawing nonstop. We would go to the zoo. When you watch a movie like The Lion King, how do you think animators learn how to draw animals? You think they just show up at their desk and they can draw anything? No. They spend 10 hours at the zoo a week for years. They get anatomy books to learn the anatomy of elephants before they even get to the zoo. It takes years and years to learn just one animal. We drew all the time. I don't care how cold it was outside, we were drawing. And junior year, Andy and I both sent our portfolios to Disney. And at that point, everyone in the school knew there's two guys that are going to get into Disney, Saul and Andy. You know why? Because we never put our sketchbooks down. So we send the portfolios in, we wait, a couple months go by, I remember being home in New York. I get a call one day and it's Andy on the phone. I'm like, hey man, what's up? He's like, blink off, did you hear? I'm like, no, did you? He's like, yeah. I said, what'd you hear? He says, I got it. I said, you got what? He says, I got the internship. I said, you got it? That's amazing, congratulations. He's like, but you didn't hear? I'm like, no, but they could be trying to call me right now. I gotta hang up. We didn't have call waiting back then, you know? <laughs> I'm pacing back and forth in the dining room. My mom comes in at that moment. She's like, honey, what happened? I'm like, mom, Andy just heard. He got into the Disney, he got the internship. She starts pacing back and forth. We're both waiting for the phone to ring. It's not ringing. Minutes are going by. It's not ringing. I look to my mom, I say, mom, did you pay the phone bill? <laughs> Is there a dial tone? There's a dial tone, not ringing. I can't stand it anymore. I pick up the phone, I call up the head of Disney myself. I get this guy on the phone from Disney, I say, hi, my name is Saul Blinkoff. Oh, Saul, I have your name on the list here. I'm like, yeah, and? He goes, yeah. He didn't make it. I said, what? What, what, what do you mean? He says, yeah, you, you didn't make it. I said, well, what about Andy? He says, yeah, Andy made it. You did it. I was like, oh, thanks. I got the phone. It was one of those moments in life, and we've all had it. It's bitter, and it's sweet. Sweet, my best friend's getting his dream. Bitter, I wasn't a part of it. You know where Andy gets to go? To Disney World. You know what Disney World calls Disney World? They call it the happiest place on Earth. Earth. Yeah, see, they don't call it the happy place on Earth. They call it the happiest place. That means, if you're not at Disney World, you're not the happiest. <laughs> It's sunny. It's beautiful. Andy is going to the happiest place on earth. You know where I get to go back to? Columbus, Ohio in the winter time. Bitter cold gray skies. The most depressing place on earth. And when I get to school, I get to have something else really special. I get to walk the halls of school and have everybody come up to me and say, Saul, what are you doing here? I thought you got into Disney. Oh, you didn't make it. I'm sorry. Oh, you didn't make it. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Oh, where's Andy? Oh, he got in? You did? Oh, I'm sorry. I became known as the guy that was friends with the guy that got into Disney. And you know what else I became known as? The guy that didn't get what he wanted. I felt like a loser. You know, Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh, thanks for noticing me. You know, that's how I felt. I felt like a loser. I was known as the guy that didn't get what he wanted. And they came up with a brilliant solution to get that feeling away. Instead of being known as the guy that didn't get what he wanted, I took away the want. I decided to give up. And I gave up on my entire dream. Remember I told you about that light switch that's either on or off? Well, I can tell you very confidently I shut it off. Because you know what happened? Reality set in. Do you know what reality is? Andy's an awesome artist. It's obvious. I'm not. Just because my passion, just because my dream, I want this, that's nice. There's a lot of people that have dreams. Who says I should be good enough to get something like that? I wasn't talented. I wasn't good. I gave up. A friend calls me up on the phone a couple days later. He says to me, Saul, I got tickets to go see a movie. Do you want to go? I said, I'm not really in the mood. He says, but they're free tickets. I said, oh, okay, I'll go. <laughs> see, when someone offers you free in college, you go. So I go to the movies, and I'm watching this movie, and tears are streaming down my face. I'm watching this movie. It's a true story about a guy who's five feet tall. He doesn't have an ounce of athletic ability, and he wants to play football at one of the greatest football universities, Notre Dame. Anyone know what movie it is? Who knows? Rudy. Yeah, Rudy. There it is. Just a quick show of hands. How many people have seen Rudy? Who's seen this movie? Whoa, not enough. Okay. All right. Got to see this movie. It's a true story. If you were friends with Rudy Rudiger and he told you, my dream was to play football at Notre Dame, you know what you would have told him as his friend? <laughs> you would have said, dude, I love you, but get a new dream. It's not going to happen. But you know what Rudy said? Oh, yeah? Well, well, we'll just see about that. And he tries to get in. And you know what happens? He gets rejected. He tries a second year, rejected. Third year, rejected. But fourth year, See, if you look at the movie poster for the movie, Rudy, it says when people say dreams don't come true, tell them about Rudy. He gets in. And that's when I was crying. And I'm watching this movie because I'm thinking one thing. If an unathletic kid could get into Notre Dame, then an untalented artist could get into Disney. And I decided right then and there I would never give up again. And I took that light switch and I bolted it in place. Remember? calling up the Disney company the next day. I get the guy on the phone and I say, can I ask you a question? How close was I? He said, Saul, what do you mean? I said, out of all the portfolios that came in, how close was I? He said, Saul, we picked 17 from thousands around the world. You made it to number 20. 20? I missed it by three. I was going to give up on my whole dream. Do you know how many times in life we could be so close to achieving something, but we feel like we're miles away? If you went over to Albert Einstein when he was creating the 900,000th light bulb, and it blew up in his face, and he was going to give up, you know what you would have told him? Albert, please don't give up. Trust me, one more, two more, you're going to make it. We feel we're miles away. Then I asked the guy at Disney a question. I said, well, if you didn't accept me, why? You see, there's times in our lives where we're going to fail at something. What do we do in those moments? If you walk away, if you drive away from a business meeting, a promotion you didn't get, and all you're thinking in your head is, well, you know what, what do they know? Forget them. Th th then you're wasting away. Instead, turn that car back, sit that person down, grab them by the face and say, why didn't you promote me? I want to get better. If I failed, why did I fail? Because if you get the answer then, greatness. So I asked the guy at Disney, how come I didn't get in? He said, Saul, you, you can't just sit in drawing class, always drawing the model from the same point of view. You need to move around. Give us perspective. You know, look up at the model or, or look down at the model. I thought to myself, wow, answer key. Thank you. I go to figure drawing class the next day. I take a huge wooden box, it's this big. We use it for still lifes. And I bring it to the center of the room. I Okay, well, that's, that's loud, okay. I went to the center of the room. I stand up on a chair on this wood box. My head is 20 feet up in the air. I'm looking down at the model. She's looking up at me like I'm nuts. I was doing what Disney said, put perspective in your drawing. I remember some guys in the back of the room, they're saying, look at the loser standing up on the box. Did I care what they thought? 
who cares what all those people in school say to you or your friends say to you? They're obviously not your friends. The guy at Disney told me what I needed to work on. That was enough for me. After class that day, my professor brings me over to him. He says, so let me ask you a question. Can you control whether Disney says yes or no? I said, no. He says, can you control how good all the other artists are that send portfolios? I said, no. He says, so what is it that you can control? So I thought about it, and I said, well, I can control how good I am as an artist, right? He said, no, you can't. You think Michael Jordan could control that he become the best basketball player who ever lived? No, he controlled one thing. He took 450 jump shots every day before breakfast. My professor looked at me and said, the only thing that we can control in our lives is how hard we work. The investment we make into something. The outcome, that's not up to us. It's the same thing with relationships, by the way. You can't make someone love you. All you can control is what you put into the relationship. Then my professor looked at me and said a bit of wisdom I never forgot. And the reason I never forgot is because he told me to write it down right then and there. So I wrote it down. He said, write this down. Nobody worked harder today than me. If you can't say that, he said, you don't go to bed. If you can't say it and it's true, you don't go to bed. Nobody worked harder today than me. I wrote it down. I put it on a piece of paper. I put it up over my desk with my two rejection letters from Disney. I was inspired. I went back to my dorm room. I had hundreds of drawings that I had done throughout my art school. All my favorite drawings. I remember drawing this and this. I loved them all. You know what I did? I ripped them all down. I took every drawing off the wall. Instead, I put up drawings from Michelangelo, from Leonardo da Vinci. I called up Andy at Disney. I'm like, send me drawings from artists. I wallpapered my room with artwork that was a hundred times better than me. You know why? Because when we want to grow, we need a vision of what we're trying to aspire to be. We need a vision of what we're trying to become. As a matter of fact, Rabbi David Aaron, great rabbi, said something beautiful. He says, we're not really human beings, we're human becomings. Isn't that awesome? We grow, we evolve, we change. Amazing. I remember getting my portfolio together to send to Disney. I'm about to send it in, and I find out I'm not allowed. Because Beauty and the Beast was nominated for a Best Picture Oscar, and because of that, more and more people were sending their portfolios into Disney. Disney was getting flooded with portfolios. They said, we're not gonna just let anyone send them in anymore. We're gonna have a Disney guy come from the studio to your school. He's gonna look at your work, and if he likes your work, then he'll send it to Florida for another round of review. So I remember walking into this room, and this guy from Disney is there. He's gotta be 72 years old. Had a white beard, looked like a rabbi. And uh, I showed him my portfolio. That's the picture taken at that moment. And uh, this guy was an original animator on Sleeping Beauty. He used to hang out with Walt Disney. You think I wasn't terrified showing him my work? I was terrified. I was terrified. He takes my portfolio. He starts looking through it. He says, so my boy. That's how he talked. He had the coolest voice. So my boy, I like your drawings. I'd like to send your portfolio to Florida for further review. Would you like that? I'm like, what, I like that? Yes, I would like that. I hand him my portfolio. And as I hand him my portfolio, I don't let go. I'm clutched onto it, and so is he. And I'm in a tug of war with the 75-year-old man. He's like going like this, I'm like, ah. he's like, so my boy, what are you doing? I, it's a true story. I yanked the portfolio out of his hands. I asked him a question. I said, Bill, let me ask you, where are you going after this school? He said, well, after here, I'm going to this school, then I'm going there. I said, so when do you really need the portfolio in Florida? He says, not for two and a half weeks. Why? I said, because any drawing in this book will be worse than any drawing I do tomorrow. You see, any drawing I do tomorrow will have to be better than every single drawing in this book. And if I have two more weeks, I can do better work. He said, no problem. You know what I felt at that moment? For the first time in my life, someone other than my mom liked my artwork. <laughs> my mom was always, honey, you're so talented. I'm like, mom, you have to say that. You're my mom. You were saying that when I learned how to go to the bathroom when I was a year old. You see, in life, when we fail, it's a perfect opportunity to ask, why did I fail? But even when we succeed, even when the guy from Disney looked at me and said, I like your work, I want to send it on. You think I should have walked out going, oh, I feel so good about myself? No, because I know I'm not perfect. 
And if I could get him to tell me what I could work on in my work, I could be better. Two more weeks, I could do better. So I asked him, any ideas what I could do to make my work better? So he looked at me and said, so why don't you put effects in your portfolio? So I said, well, what's effects? So when you guys watch a movie like The Lion King and it's raining, there's fire, there's water, there's smoke, that's a division of animators called effects animators. He said, why don't you put effects in your portfolio? I said, thank you. Answer key. Answer key to growing. I go back to my dorm room. I set up a pot with water. I'm putting on that faucet. I'm watching the drips, you know, watch the way the ripples do. I did pages and pages of effects drawings. I set up a candle and I lit it and I'm watching the way that that flame dances on the wick. I did drawings and drawings of it. As a matter of fact, then I took my portfolio, I actually put it under my bed. Why would I put my portfolio of all this blood, sweat, and tears under my bed? Because I imagined in my head at that moment, what if it doesn't even exist? Can I really create a new portfolio in two and a half weeks? And that is exactly what I did. You know why? Because this is not what I wanted to happen. I didn't want to send my portfolio to Bill with all those drawings he had seen, with those effects drawings, have him open up my portfolio and say, Oh, Saul, I remember him. Nice guy. Let's see. Oh, I remember that drawing. Oh, that's a good one. I'm, oh, look, he did some effects drawings. You know, I didn't want that to happen because that's what he was expecting to happen. Instead, I sent him an entirely new portfolio in two weeks. So I'm sure he opened it up and went, Oh, Saul, I remember him. Wait, wait a minute. I never saw that drawing. I, I never saw that drawing. Wait, he created a new portfolio in two weeks? It's exactly what I did because I heard something amazing in life. A bit of wisdom. Exceed expectations. Exceed expectations. Someone's expecting five, you give them six. They want you there at eight o'clock, you get there at 7.50. It's the same thing in marriage, by the way. My wife's like, oh honey, could you pick this up on the way home? Okay, you know what I might bring her also? Flowers. Oh, I could bring her exactly what she asked for. Or I could say, you know what, didn't she forget that she wanted to pick this up last week? You know, I'll drive a little extra far to get that too. It's a great quality, succeed expectations. So I send that portfolio in to him and I wait. Two months go by. You ever have to wait for something? It's excruciating. The anxiety, you can't sleep at night. I'm on the phone with my mom. Honey, you're gonna get it. I'm like, I know, mom, you keep telling me. And then one day I get a call and it's Andy on the phone. I'm like, hey man, what's up? He's like, blink off, you're not gonna believe this. I said, what am I not gonna believe? He says, they built a brand new wing on the studios for the next interns. He says, you deserve to be there. I'm like, thanks, man. He says, you know what else they did? I said, what? He says, they built a basketball court for the animators. You love to play basketball. You deserve to play on that court. I'm like, thanks, man. He says, but there is one more thing. I said, what? He says, they put a picture. They, I put a, a paper up on the wall. And it has a list of the next interns. I said, yeah, and? He goes, you're on the list. I said, what? He goes, you did. I'm like, thank you, thank you. He's like, what are you thanking me for? You did it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I said, say it again. He goes, you did it. I said, I did what? He goes, you got the intern job. Unbelievable. Thing. I hang up the phone. I go over to my tape player. You kids don't know where tapes are. They play music, whatever. <laughs> and at the top of my lungs, it's the circle of life. And it moves us all. People are like leaning outside. They're like, Blinkoff got in. I remember going to the phone, dialing as fast as I could. My mom, can you imagine how excited I was to call her? I get on the phone, she could hear it in my voice. She's like, honey, did you do it? I said, no, mom, we did it. She's like, what do you mean we did it? I said, mom, you remember you embarrassed the heck out of me? You took me to Disney World, asking everyone, you took me to this art school, you took me to that art school. But you know what, mom, this winter, you can stay in New York, because I'm going to the happiest place on earth. <laughs> I land in Disney World. There's a guy at the airport with one of those signs, you know, the people with the signs, like, wow, I'm finally one of those guys, you know? There's like Mickey Mouse pointing to the sign, cool. He drives me to the Walt Disney Studios, and I remember walking under the sign that says, Artist Entrance. I'm like, wow, where am I? I walk into a room the size of this room, and there's 15 animation desks, big wooden ones. This is before computer animation. And I look to each desk, and I see in the corner there's one desk, it's got my name on it. Saul Blinkoff, Jewish kid from New York. You know, if you forget everything I just told you in the last 20 minutes, I would be totally okay with that. 
I hope you walk out of here tonight remembering something very important. I hope you tell every person you know on planet Earth that's not here, every friend you have and everyone you're related to, you know who you met tonight? You met a guy that achieved his dream who was not talented. You met a guy who achieved his dream in an incredibly competitive place who was the worst artist in his school. Do you know how many times I meet students and people and I say, what do you want to do? I want to do that. So why are you doing that? Because that's too hard. So figure out what you have to do to step over it. Go for everything you want and give it 110%. I'm on the internship with artists from around the world. Incredible artists. I mean, I, I, if I, could, I could go through this guy's at Blue Sky working on uh, Ice Age movies. She directed Prep and Landing, if you remember that Disney short. This guy's in Canada teaching animation. I mean, these are incredibly talented people. And Frozen, art director. I mean, forget it. These are incredible artists. And I felt like I was the worst one again. I had to work really hard. On the internship, this was my desk. Here I am with the big glasses. Don't laugh. You all have pictures that are embarrassing too, I'm sure. <laughs> I remember at the end of um, the internship, we get called into an office, and the same guy with the beard says to us, you guys are gonna be the first interns to work on a movie. You're gonna work on the movie, Pocahontas. And I was like, wow, I'm gonna get to work on a Disney movie? Are you kidding me? The very first scene I got to animate was a very dramatic scene. It's a scene where Pocahontas is in the forest talking to John Smith. She's supposed to marry this guy, Kokoum. He's a Native American guy. He finds out she's talking to another guy. Well, he's not very happy about that. This very dramatic scene in the middle of the night. He walks through the forest. He knows they're talking there. There's these bushes and these leaves hanging. He pushes through these leaves and he sees her talking to him. They asked me to animate the leaves. That's it. <laughs> I was the leaf guy at Disney. <laughs> and you know what? I was okay with that. I was terrified. You do a drawing of a leaf on your piece of paper, it, it's this big. On a movie screen, it's a 50-foot leaf. It better be a good leaf. I took a Xerox of those leaf drawings. I sent it home to my mom. She walks around telling everyone in the community, my son draws leaves at Disney. She's so proud. <laughs> Moms, love them. After Pocahontas, I get called into the office. He says to me, Saul, we want to offer you a five-year contract. Would you like that? I said, why do you always ask me that? Yes, I would like that. He gives me a contract, I sign it. This time, no tug of war. Hey man, you can have it. A week later, something comes in the mail, changes my life forever. A paycheck. They're paying me to do what I love? You have to be kidding. I go to Abercrombie and Fitch, I'm like, I'll take this, I'll take this, I'll take this. <laughs> I went and bought a sports car, I got an apartment, I mean, I got it. the sun is out, everything's going well. Then I started working on this movie, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, remember that one? Yeah, I got to animate this guy, Hugo, a little gargoyle. Midway on that movie, I get a call from my mom. She says, honey, do you have any vacation time coming up? I said, yeah. She says, well, why don't you come to Israel with me and your dad? Ah, he said it, Israel. You did know something Jewish was going to be in this talk, right, people? <laughs> you didn't think this is the how do you become a Disney animator talk, did you? Oh, hopefully if you have those dreams, you've learned a couple of things along the way. I say to my parents, yeah, I'll go to Israel with you. I go to Israel with my parents. Now, just a quick show of hands, no guilt. I will not give any Jewish guilt here. If you haven't been to the old city of Jerusalem, please raise your hand high. Let's see, how many people have not been to the old city of Jerusalem? That wasn't high, higher. There it is, one. Okay, people, two. They have to go. Do they have to go? Yeah. Rabbi, you got a trip to Israel? You gonna help them get there? You guys gotta go. It's an unbelievable thing. It's like going home. I'm walking to the old city of Jerusalem, these rocks, these stones, it's incredible. I walk into a bagel place, of course, in the old city, there's a bagel place. It's known as Bonkers Bagels. It's not there anymore. I just dated myself. You remember it? Bonkers Bagels. Now, I'm from New York. So as a New Yorker, I think I know how to order a bagel. So I walk into the bagel place and I tell this guy what I want, you know, Sometimes my son Asher, he's seven, he says, Dad, what bagel should I order when we take him out for bagels? He's like, I can't decide. Do I get the plain bagel? Do I get the sesame? Do I? I'm like, Ashi, why don't you get everything? He's like, what do you mean everything? I'm like, get the everything bagel. You don't even have to decide. He's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I walk into this bagel place, and I tell the Israeli guys, this young guy, I said, listen, here's what I want. I want an everything bagel. And I want cream cheese on both sides. I want smoked salmon here, I want the onion here, but I don't want the cheese up there because when it's against the cream cheese, it sticks to the roof of your mouth. As a matter of fact, let me do you a drawing of the layers I want in my bagel. <laughs> Control freak? Maybe a little. 
So he actually gets inspired because he wants to make this bagel the right way. So he starts writing it down, you know, writing it together, drawing it, he's, and he's making my bagel. As he's making my bagel, in walks a normal looking guy about my age, wearing a baseball hat, wearing a basketball logo on his hat. We start talking about sports. I said to the guy, what are you doing here? He says, I'm in a yeshiva program. I said, yeshiva? You don't look like a yeshiva guy. Doesn't the yeshiva guy have like the curls and the fringes? You don't look like that. He said, well, I'm here learning about Judaism. I said, why? He goes, because I want to find out how I fit in to the Jewish people. I said, what do you mean fit in? What are you, a puzzle piece? <laughs> this is what he said. He said, I was raised a certain way Jewishly that my parents decided. My mom and dad decided what Hebrew school I was going to go to. My mom and dad decided what I was going to do for Shabbat. My mom and dad decided what I ate in the house and outside the house. Everything Jewish about me was decided from my mom and dad. He said, now that I'm a man, now that I'm an adult, I want to find out what Judaism means to me. And when he said that, I was envious. I thought, wow, I would love to do something like that. I was inspired, but I had my dream job at Disney. How will I ever be able to do that? All of a sudden, the Israeli guy told me my bagel was ready. I was hungry. I forgot all about the guy with the hat. I don't know what happened to him. I'm looking at the bagel he made, and I'm checking the layers, and he did it perfectly. I'm like, wow, he actually did it awesome. But for some reason, before he gives me the bagel, he takes the bagel, puts it under a waffle iron, and goes, <laughs> flattens it like a pancake. All my beautiful layers came out the sides on this white wax paper in a disgusting heap of a mess. I'm telling you people, I'm holding a mess in my hand. It's like he knew what he was going to do. He's like, oh, watch, I'll make the bagel perfect, but watch, I'm going to get him. I'm holding this mess in my hand. I look to the Israeli guy. I say, excuse me, look what happened to my bagel. He looks at me with a straight face and says, so what do you want me to do? <laughs> and I'm thinking, there's really no answer. I have a feeling that's a rhetorical question. And I learned to love the flattened bagel. Anyway, I returned to Disney. I start working on the film Mulan. Do you remember Mulan? Remember that movie? I got to animate Shang, the captain. Remember, let's get down to business to defeat mm, mm, the Huns. Huh. You know, before I came here, my oldest daughter, Meira, she's 11. She says, Dad, you gonna tell your story? Your story to them in Mexico? I said, yeah. She says, you're not gonna sing, are you? <laughs> I said, honey, would that embarrass you? She's like, yeah. I said, then I'm definitely going to sing. <laughs> if you're a dad and you don't embarrass your kid once a week, you're probably not doing a good job as a dad. <laughs> I'll tell you um, one of the little hidden things about how we make movies in, in animation. You know, all animators have mirrors on their desks. Why? Because when you're animating a character, you need to see your own facial expressions to put into the character. Every scene that you animate, you have to act out yourself. I remember Glenn Keane stories of him on Beauty and the Beast, an incredible animator. He was animating the beast, and he would run through the studio with a giant cape just to see how a cape would settle. Walt Disney would bring deer into the studio when they were making Bambi, always drawing from life. Well, one of my buddies was animating in the song, let's get down to business, and it's a scene where Mulan, who's dressed like, like a guy, she goes to the army, if you don't know the movie, Mulan dresses up like a guy to go into the army so her old father doesn't have to. It's kind of like Yentl in China, okay? So she's in the army, and these guys want to mess her up. They take a big black beetle, they drop it down her back, and whoa, they want to mess her up. And my friend's animating that scene. So he says to me, Saul, you're good at figuring out acting. I'm like, thank you. He's like, can you come help me figure this out? We go into a conference room. He sets up a video camera. I grab a yardstick, and I'm trying to, you know, figure it out. I can't get those poses right. Then I get an idea. I'm like, hold on a sec. I go into the kitchen. I get a big hunk of ice from the freezer. I'm like, get your camera ready. I drop the ice down. I'm like, whoa. So when you watch the movie, it's not little Asian Mulan. It's a tall Jew from New York with ice down his back. <laughs> but that's really how we make the movies. Well, after Mulan, which is an incredible experience, we found out the next movie we're working on is Tarzan. You remember that one? Son of man, look to the sky. I embarrassed my daughter again. Nice. But there was one problem. They weren't ready for the animators to work on Tarzan. It takes four years to make one Disney movie. The first year, they're writing the script. The second year, they're designing characters. Year three, the color, the effects, the music, the four years. Well, for Tarzan, the day that I put down my pencil and I wasn't working on Mulan anymore, 
they weren't ready for the animators to draw on Tarzan yet because they were having trouble with the script. So we come into work every day, the animators with nothing to do. It's awesome. You're getting paid to do nothing. They call it downtime. If anyone ever offers you a job and they say, by the way, we have downtime, take the job. <laughs> One month of downtime turned into two months, three months. You know what you do when you're in downtime at Disney World? You ride the roller coasters. Every day, Space Mountain, woo! Flash Mountain, woo! Thunder Mountain, woo! Right? I became quite the mountaineer in all these Disney mountain rides. A lot of mountain rides. I remember Disney had over 15 hotels at Disney World at the time. Each hotel was themed a different way. So me and my friends, Disney said, you don't even have to go into the studio anymore. We'll still pay you. Don't even come in. Amazing. Who's getting paid to live at Disney World? I go into the different hotels. I go into one swimming pool. It has one of those lazy rivers. You ever been on those lazy rivers? floating on my back, sun is out. My brother's in law school, freezing cold. He's like, what are you up to these days? I'm like, Jay, you don't wanna go. <laughs> and I'm telling you guys, at that moment in my life, I had a realization. You know what I have is I'm lying on my back in this lazy river, I don't even have to swim. The water's taking me around, the sun is out, I got a cold drink, pina colada in my hand. At that moment in my life, I had everything I ever could have wanted. What if you could make a list of every single thing that you want in life? What if you had it at 24? I had my job. I had my dream job. I was making money. I had this incredible girlfriend who I later married. I had, this, I had everything I ever could have wanted. And I'm telling you guys, it wasn't enough for me. I realized something's missing. And I told all my friends who weren't Jewish, you know what? I'm going to Israel. They're like, why are you going to Israel? I said, because now I have time to figure out how I fit in to the Jewish people. They're like, what are you, a puzzle piece? <laughs> I go to Israel, 10 days, that's it. I'm on a program, a yeshiva program called Israelite with two rabbis, Rabbi David Aaron and Rabbi Biddy Friedman. Anyone ever heard of them? Incredible. I walk into this room, oh, there's Tarzan. There's the two rabbis. I walk in there and they speak to us for 15 minutes. And what this rabbi said in 15 minutes changed the rest of my life. See, before that it was movies, it was E.T., The Little Mermaid, Rudy. Now it's an actual living, breathing human being. And here's what he said. He looked to us and he said, how many of you know what a mezuzah is? I said, a mezuzah, I know what it is, the thing on the doorway, yeah. He said, well, what's it for? I said, uh, doesn't it like protect your house from evil spirits or something? He's like, oh, okay, we'll come back to that. He said, what's inside the mezuzah? I said, there's something inside? I thought it was a piece of artwork that went on the wall that had Shin for Shaddai, God's name. I didn't know there was anything inside. He says, I want you to imagine two things. He says, I want you to imagine what if it's true that God is actually real? What if it's true that there actually is a God? Forget Judaism, Christianity, forget all these religions. Forget everything you ever learned in school. What if it's just real? You close your eyes and it's real. The creator of the world exists. If that's real, wow. He said, what if it's also true that God actually wrote Letter by letter, the Torah itself. Do you know what we're commanded to do in the Torah? We're commanded to take part of that Torah. It's the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. We're commanded to take the Shema, which is basically from the Torah, which is a letter from God. We're supposed to take the Shema, put it in a little parchment, and put it on our doorway. Doesn't make sense. If you guys went home tonight, there's an envelope that came in the mail. You forgot earlier. You're like, oh, look who came in the mail, honey. And you show it to your wife, and it says, it's addressed to you from the creator of the world. She'd be like, okay, who's playing a joke on me? But what if she opened it up, and all of a sudden that letter starts floating, and it's glowing? You'd be like, honey, I got the letter from God. Like, what would you do? You take a selfie with that letter, right? You'd Snapchat that. You take a glass jar, put it around it with a red laser security system. You'd have the God Letter Museum. Here's what you wouldn't do. You wouldn't say, OMG, do you know where we're gonna put this letter from the creator of the world? I got a spot, honey, we've been needing something here. Doorway. It doesn't make sense. And this is what the rabbi said. He said a mezuzah is not a thing that you place on a doorway. He said, you know what a doorway is? It's a place of transition. You're going from your home out into the world, you walk through a doorway. A mezuzah is not a thing, it's a moment, it's an opportunity. I'm going out into the world, I get to ask myself a question. 
I'm going out into the world. What kind of a world do I want to create? What am I living for? We're going into our home. We wipe off our feet. There's that mezuzah again. I actually have a moment to stop and ask myself a question. I'm going into my home. What kind of a home do I want to create? What are the values I want to have in my home? Why do I need a partner to help me create a home? I said to him, I had no idea there was meaning in a mezuzah like this. I thought it was a piece of art that was on my door since I was a little kid. Then he told us a story. He said, thousands of years ago, the Jewish people had a temple. It wasn't just a temple, it was the temple. Every Jew lived right there in Jerusalem. And then you know what the Romans did? They came and burned down the temple. They weren't telling the Jews, you need to go pray somewhere else. We need this location. The Romans were telling the Jews, you can't be Jews. They tried to take away their identity. Then he told one more story. True story in the Holocaust of a woman, 21, 22. She's in Auschwitz. She looks to one of the rabbis in the camps, and she says to the rabbi, Rabbi, I need a knife. And the rabbi looks into her eyes, and he can tell that she wants to end her life. And he says, don't do this. Don't let them win. Don't let them take your identity away. And as they're speaking, two Nazi guards overhear them speaking. The Nazi guard walks up and says, Jew, what are you doing talking? If you're a Jew, they'll shoot you for talking. They'll shoot you anyway. They're murderers. And she looks up to one of the Nazis and she sees in his breast pocket is the outline of a knife. And she looks to him and demands his knife. She says, give me your knife. He can't believe she's ordering him around. The other one says, give her the knife. What's she going to do? We have guns. They hand her this razor sharp knife. She reaches down to her leg and pulls up a bundle of clothing. She undoes the bundle and inside is a brand new newborn baby boy. It's her son. And she takes her own son in her arms and she takes this razor sharp knife and she says to the creator of the world, God, you gave me this beautiful baby boy and now I'm going to return him to you perfect. And with that, she took that knife. The rabbi looks away. He can't even look. And she performed on her own son a bris milah, a circumcision. Because you know why? The kid's a Jew. And she didn't forget her identity. And she takes her own son. Because it says in the Torah, give your son a circumcision. She takes her own son, who's crying from the bris milah. And she takes her, and I'm a dad. And I have a son, and I don't know how you do this. She takes her own son and puts him into the arms of the Nazi monster. The baby's crying. She turns to walk away. No more crying baby. Another gunshot to her head. Both of them murdered. It's a true story. Can you hear that story? Can you imagine the tears over Auschwitz? But if you go deep into that story, there is something so profound. There's a name on the back of that wall right there. It's Reb Noach Weinberg. He started Aish. You know what he said? He said, if we don't know what we're willing to die for, we're not living for anything. If we don't know what we're willing to die for, what are we living for? Each one of us stands on the shoulders of the most unbelievable history that any people has ever known. It is nothing short of miraculous that Jews exist on planet Earth. If we could go back thousands of years, the rabbi said to us, and you could whisper into the ear of one Jew as they're watching their temple burn, don't worry, because in the future, the Romans are going to be gone. We're going to have the state of Israel. We're going to be able to live a Jewish life. That Jew wouldn't have believed you. If you could go back to that night in Auschwitz when that woman was handing her own son, knowing he was going to be murdered, but at least she wanted him killed as a Jew. If you could whisper into her ear, don't worry, in the future, you know what we're going to have in Mexico? Ash Mexico. I can come in any night I want and learn Jewish wisdom anytime I want. Friday night, I can light Shabbos candles. I can put on tefillin. I can live a Jewish life. They wouldn't believe you. And now that we know that, we have to answer the question, what will I do with it? How will I live? I said to the rabbi the last day, I never knew any of this growing up. He said, Saul, it doesn't matter what you know. It matters what you do with what you know. I left Israel inspired. I identified more as a Jew than ever before. I went back to Disney. You know what I did? I was working on Tarzan. I loved it. But you know what I did every Friday night? Every Friday night when you're in the movie business, you know what you do Friday night? You go to the movies. Because there's a new movie out every Friday. I go to the movies with my friends. And when I would come home, I would read something Jewish. I opened up an unbelievable book called The Torah.